Plutarch on Superstition chapter 11 and 12. Is it, then, an unholy thing to speak mainly of the gods, but not unholy to have a mean opinion of them? Or does the opinion of him who speaks malignly make his utterances improper? It is a fact that we hold up malign speaking as a sign of animosity, and those who speak ill of us we regard as enemies, since we feel they must also think ill of us. You see what kind of thoughts the superstitious have about the gods. They assume that the gods are rash, faithless, fickle, vengeful, cruel, and easily offended, and as a result the superstitious man is bound to hate and fear the gods. Why not, since he thinks that the worst of his ills are due to them, and will be due to them in the future? As he hates and fears the gods, he is an enemy to them. And yet, though he dreads them, he worships them and sacrifices to them and besieges their shrines, and this is nothing surprising, for it is equally true that men give welcome to despots and pay court to them and erect golden statues in their honor, but in their hearts they hate them and shake their head. Hermelos attended upon Alexander, Pausanias served as bodyguard for Philip, and Chiria for Gaius Caligula, yet each one of these must have said as he followed along, Verily, I would have vengeance if only my strength were sufficient. The atheist thinks there are no gods, the superstitious man wishes there were none, but believes in them against his will, for he is afraid not to believe. And yet, as Tantalus would be glad indeed to get out from under the rock suspended above his head, so the superstitious man would be glad to escape his fear by which he feels oppressed no less than Tantalus by his rock, and he would call the condition of the atheist happy because it is a state of freedom. But, as things are, the atheist has neither part nor lot in superstition, whereas the superstitious man by preference would be an atheist, but is too weak to hold the opinion about the gods which he wishes to hold. Moreover, the atheist has no part in causing superstition, but superstition provides the seed from which atheism springs, and when atheism has taken root, superstition supplies it with a defense, not a true one or a fair one, but one not destitute of some speciousness. For it is not because these people saw in the heavens anything to find fault with, or anything not harmonious or well-ordered in the stars or seasons, or in the revolution of the moon, or in the movements of the sun around the earth, artisans of day and night, or in the feeding and growth of living creatures, or in the sowing and harvesting of crops, as the result of which they decided against the idea of a god in the universe. But the ridiculous actions and emotions of superstition, its words and gestures, magic charms and spells, rushing around and beating of drums, impure purifications and dirty sanctifications, barbarous and outlandish penances, and mortifications at the shrines, all of these give occasion to some to say that it were better there should be no gods at all than gods who accept with pleasure such forms of worship and are so overbearing, so petty, and so easily offended.